Is that going? It is going. Here we go. Sarah Hurwitz, welcome to the show. I'm excited you're here and I'm thankful for your patience from last weekend. So apologies again for that. Oh, Welcome. Not a problem at all. And I am thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So the question I ask every time, and I think a lot of people ask this question, but I tend to ask it a slightly different way. Um, when you say, hey, I'm Sarah, and this is what makes me me, like, what are those pivotal points as you think back over the course of your life that you're like, yeah, this is actually the things that made me what I am today. Not what you do today is easily, easily Googleable. So let's not do that. But what are some of those things that kind of make you, you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think dropping out of Hebrew school in sixth grade was something that kind of has made me me. It kind of got, it got my, got me and my family in many ways kind of disconnected from Judaism, which turns out to be kind of important later on. So I think that's a big one. Um, <laughs> I think you know, interning in Washington D.C. in in the Senate in the White House when I was in college, that was a big thing that made me made me realize how much I wanted to work in government and politics. I think it just showed me the power of what what government can do when it is when it's run by people who are decent and humane and, and care about the best interests of the American people. Okay. Seems quaint now, but that that was the thing <laughs> at one point. Um, and then I just sort of think that was a really big thing for me uh, that made me who I am. Um, I think also, you know, it's funny. I think meeting this guy named Josh Gottheimer, who's now a congressman from New Jersey, but was one of my law school classmates, that was a really big moment for me because I, I met him I, I went to law school after basically failing as a speechwriter early on in my career. You know, my early mm -hmm. 20s, I was a speechwriter for a U.S. senator named Tom Harkin from Iowa. Job was like, I just couldn't get his voice, didn't know how to write, decided to go to law school, never write speeches again. And I met Josh, who had been a writer previously for President Clinton, and he, he actually really believed in me. And he was like, no, you can do this. And he taught me how to write. We freelanced together. We worked on a bunch of campaigns. He really helped me get a bunch of political jobs that were very important to me. Um, and he kind of, he just always believed in my ability to be a good, good speechwriter. Um, so I think that was a big moment. Um, meeting Michelle Obama on the 2008 mm. Obama campaign, big moment. You know, I, I was there to write for him, but meeting her, I worked with her on a speech and that made just a huge impression on me. And then I think years later, I don't know, when I was 36 years old, breaking up with this guy I was dating and being lonely and having time on my hands and then winding up just randomly taking an intro to Judaism class to fill time, that was a huge moment. Because I realized, wait a second, wait a second, like what, there's a whole bunch of wisdom and insight and depth here that I had no idea about my own tradition. So that was a really transformative moment to me that led me to a religious sort of journey of faith. Yeah, so I do want to ask you a bit because I, I don't think I've ever spoken with a speech writer, although I guess pastors write speeches and I talk to a yeah. lot of pastors, so why not? Very, but, so, very similar skill. Yeah, so are, do, are, do you call yourself a speech writer or are you, because you went to law school, so you, like, you passed the bar and everything or no? Like, I did, I passed the bar. I haven't practiced law in probably about 12 years, so I would, mm. I would not hire me to be a lawyer for anyone in any situation. So I, I'm, I consider myself a writer or a speech writer, not, okay. I am technically a lawyer, but I don't practice. Okay. And then there's a section in the beginning of the book, I think it's actually in the intro where you're like, yeah, I, I write for the president. However, I really like to write for the president's wife. Like, is that something that's communicated to the president where he's like, really? Okay. Or is it just one of those things where he's like, oh, she's over there now. It's fine. Like, how does that <laughs> mechanically work? Because I read it and I, I kept playing it through in my mind as I ran around outside. I was like, I can see myself going, I also like my wife. You chose well. Like, how does that work? Yeah, well, it's funny because I, I joined the Obama campaign in 08 to work for him. And I was writing for him full time, but I wrote Mrs. Obama's Democratic National Convention speech in 08. So I got to know her then, but I went to the White House to write for him. But I still would help her out just sort of on the side because I just, mm -hmm. I liked her. I love working with her. And, you know, after a year and a half, two years, I realized that I was just more at home in her voice. You know, I, I liked the issue she was talking about better. I felt more comfortable writing for her. And so I told my then boss, John Favreau, who now is uh, one of the hosts of Pod Save America, I told him I, I thought I wanted to move over and write full time for the first lady, which I think she was a little taken aback by. Um, but he's a really great guy and was super supportive. I think the president was maybe a little bit surprised, but I think, like you said, I think he loves his wife very much and wants mm -hmm. her to be happy. And the fact that she was happy with me as her speechwriter, you know, 
that made him happy. So I think, you know, it kind of worked out for everyone. It was kind of like a win-win. Yeah, that was where I kept coming back to. I kept coming back to, how could I get mad that anybody picked my wife? I also picked my wife. So right, great exactly. People pick it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, exactly. Um, do you miss it? Do you miss being in the White House and all of that goodness? I don't know that I'll call it goodness. All of that madness. Do you miss Yeah. It? You know, I miss my colleagues very much. Like mm -hmm. the Obama White House was like a family. Right? These people are just, they're, I mean, they're, they're brilliant, they're talented. They're also just some of the most public-minded, decent, loving, supportive people I've ever met. Right? I could pick up the phone and call anyone in that White House and say, can you help me with something? And they would say, no matter what, they'd say, how can I help, what do you need? Right? Mm -hmm. It was just that kind of place. So I miss, I miss my friends, I miss going to get coffee with them in the afternoons. I just miss like bouncing ideas off of them. You know, all the speech writers shared an office suites. We were always in and out of each other's offices. You know, we would like yell for each other through the doors. It was really, I miss that community. I don't miss speech writing, actually. I don't hmm. miss the kind of daily grind of it. It, you know, it was just a constant, you're just constantly writing on command, constantly writing on deadline. And, you know, it was, I was sort of always on alert. Like you're always kind of thinking about a speech, in a speech, worrying about the details of a speech, you know, we were so concerned about accuracy. You know, the, the Obamas would have found it unbearable to, you know, even if it was inadvertently, to have an inaccurate statement in a speech, to say something that wasn't true. I mean, that just was the worst thing you could do. So there was a lot of anxiety with the speech writers around fact checking and making mm. sure things were right. So that was <laughs> stressful. So I don't, you know, I don't miss, again, sounds quaint, but I, I don't miss that. You know, I don't miss that part, but I do, I miss my colleagues and I miss the Obamas a lot. You know, writing yeah. for Mrs. Obama, you know, you don't script someone like Michelle Obama, okay? Let's be very clear. This is a woman who knows who she is. She always knows what she wants to say. So what you do when you write for someone like that is you channel her, right? I would sit down with her and say, what do you want to say? And she would just dictate all this great language and I would type it up verbatim and then I would read that into, into a draft for her. And, you know, that's like, you're not writing alone, right? You're writing with a partner. So when I switch back to my own life and writing myself in my own voice, you know, writing a book, it was like kind of lonely and actually a little bit challenging. So I, mm -hmm. I, I miss that writing partner as well. Yeah. Um, so the book that you wrote um, that I'm assuming after the blazing op-ed that you underplayed earlier, I'm, I'm sure it's amazing. Um, <laughs> that is called Here All Along. I didn't write that. I think that's what it's called, right? Yes. Yes. Because I'll be honest, Sarah, this is the version of your book that I have. Like it's <laughs> literally not the bound version of the book. So I don't know where the title is mixed in all of that paper. Um, <laughs> I also thought I'd be quaint, I'm gonna use your word, and save paper. And so I printed it duplex, but the problem is page one is on one side and page 106 is on the other. So it is uh, it's really, like because I, I think it intended to be pressed <laughs> together. But either way, Happens. I made it work. I made it, <laughs> I made it work. So here all along, what is that? Who's here all along? Where were you? Like, what are you intending to say with that metaphor? I don't know if that actually is a metaphor, but that's what I'm Yeah, wondering. no, it's actually not even a metaphor. It's pretty just straight up explaining my Jewish journey, which was you know, realizing at the age of 36 that this tremendous tradition that is my birthright had been here all along and I had known nothing about it. You know, I think you know, growing up, I, in my family, you know, we went to our synagogue twice a year for the major holidays. We had a Passover Seder at one of the other major holidays. We had a Hanukkah party, but I just didn't know much about Jewish ethics or Jewish spirituality. You know, when you're a kid, you don't really understand the very deep um, wisdom and insight behind these ancient traditions, these ancient holidays and life cycle rituals. So I always just thought, oh, you know, I'm, kind of, I'm culturally Jewish. I'm Jewish, I'm Jewish by heritage, but I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not like, I don't want to do Judaism. It's boring. <laughs> and I think learning about Judaism as an adult, I realized, wow, there is this profound tradition with so much wisdom about how to be a good person, how to lead a worthy life, how to find adult, serious, spiritual connection. It had been here all along and I had no idea. Hmm. What so are some of those misconceptions that you had, do you think, when you were younger, that as you reflect back on, you're like, oh yeah, missed the boat. Like, I know I had quite a few even through college misconceptions of Christianity where I'm like, I was just absolutely lied to. Um, as I've read scripture myself, like I was just lied to. Um, what are some <laughs> of those for you? Yeah, so, you know, I think that one thing that I really, you know, growing up, if like our, you know, Jewish liturgy, it's very complex and rich and layered and ancient. It's, you know, it's the, the Jewish prayer book, which is called the Siddur. It's been developed over many, many centuries. And it has prayers from like, 
2,000 years ago and 1,500 years ago and 1,000 years ago. And if you don't have a fair amount of education, it's easy not to understand that depth. And it said it just looks like kind of a bunch of very repetitive kind of praise of a God who's kind of a man in the sky who rewards you when you're bad and punishes you, sorry, rewards you when you're good and punishes mm -hmm. you when you're bad. And, you know, I had that impression that, okay, the Jewish God is a being in the sky who controls everything and rewards and punishes us as we deserve. And I just, I don't, I didn't buy that age 11. I don't buy that now. You know, I just, I see too much evidence to the contrary every day where bad people are rewarded and good people are punished. And I find that you go down a very unimpressive theological road really quickly where it's like, okay, well, what about the Holocaust? Oh, God didn't perpetrate the Holocaust. People did. Okay. So what does God, this all powerful God do all day? Mm. Well, that's sort of, it's like, okay, guys, like these, this is not hang, hanging together. And I, I, you know, that's, I thought, well, if that's the Jewish God, then that's not for me. That's actually not the Jewish God, right? Like Judaism is a, it's an amazing tradition in that we have a lot of theological humility as Jews. You know, there is no dogma or creed or statement about what God is, or there's no sort of faith. There's really just no specific dogma or, or statement around God, because I think we feel that what we're talking about is just so big and so vast and so beyond the capacity of our tiny little human hearts and brains to articulate. And once you start trying to define God or describe God or make images of God, you're kind of almost committing idolatry, right? You're, you're kind of taking this, this vast, infinite thing that's so boundlessly big and you're making it, you're shrinking it to the size of your human comprehension. Mm -hmm. And there's a real danger in that, right? You see people doing that every day where they're like, God wants this and God hates that. And God, it's like, oh, okay, wait a second. Is that God or is that you? So I think realizing that there was this immense richness and complexity, you know, there are Jewish thinkers who say that God is everything. You're God, I'm God. The idea that there's a barrier between us, that's, that's not true. You know, the homeless man I passed on the street, that man is God, right? That, that man is a manifestation of the divine, right? That's, that's a, a Jewish idea. And, not, and by the way, many of these ideas are in other traditions as well. I'm not, none of what I'm saying is like only in Judaism. You know, many traditions have similar conceptions. There are Jewish thinkers who say that God is what happens in deep relation between two people when they are just fully contemplating each other's humanity. What arises between them is God. There's a Jewish thinker who says God is the process by which we become our highest and truest selves. So I think realizing that there was this, this like complexity and this richness and this depth around spirituality, that was like a huge, you know, a huge misconception that was blown for me. And I, I thought, wow, there's a lot here for me. Yeah. And even so, I'm going to lean on some of the scripture that I read more often. But, you know, when you're talking about God is just when two people get together, it's whatever happens when those two be so um there's you know when two or more together here i am it's just a bunch of things like and so i hear you saying all of that what i feel like some people might say is well i didn't know that's what judaism was because that sounds a bit new agey um you know of, yeah we're all god uh, pan panentheism or pantheism or whatever the word is so how would you delineate or differentiate between those two of okay well you said a lot there sarah and that's nothing's really concrete to latch on to so how would you? I don't yeah, know. like what? What is you're sort of asking? Like, what is the Jewish God? Like, give me a definition, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, well, at the you. end, I'm going to ask you what you think God is, but I can right. table that for now because I've been asking that. I'm asking that to 52 people this year, so it's been fun. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So you know, here's the thing. <laughs> There's a an old joke that like two Jews, three opinions, right? Like, um, <laughs> you know, there are many. In, in, in Judaism, you'll find that there are Jewish thinkers throughout the ages who have many different conceptions of God. I mean, even looking at the Bible, you know, looking at the Torah, which is what Jews, you know, Christians refer to the, you refer to it as the Old Testament. That's not, we, we, we call it the Tanakh, which is a, doesn't matter, but we call it the Tanakh. And the first five books of that are, that's the Torah, right? Mm -hmm. That is, that is our key holy book. You know, you see different conceptions of God in there. Right? There's a very kind of serious and stern God, there's a loving God, there's God, you know, there's a God that almost seems to have a body, there's a God that's beyond having a body, right, that there isn't some clear image of God in there, and then we had ancient rabbis who, for, you know, for the, you know, basically the, the years zero to 600 or so, were reimagining, reinterpreting the Torah, right, Jews today, I always think it's interesting that Christians seem to think that Jews, some Christians think that Jews live by the actual original version of the Bible, that's, that's insane, right? This is a, you know, a 2,500 year old document. We've spent 2,500 years reinterpreting it just like we don't live by the original version of the US Constitution, thank God, right? We've amended it to get rid of slavery and to let women vote. 
we've done something similar with our Torah and we've, you know, it says an eye for an eye. Rabbis 2000 years ago said, no, 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 no. They mean if you put out someone's eye, you have to compensate them monetarily. Well, that's not what the Torah says. That's how they reinterpret it, right? So yeah. you see that with ideas around God as well. Like those ancient rabbis, they had many conceptions of God. You have Maimonides as a great Jewish medieval thinker who has a conception of God as totally transcendent, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, okay, well then what, what is, you know, what, what is, then what's the Jewish view? There are many Jewish views of God, but you know, there is a body of Jewish law that Jews follow, you know, some more strictly, some less strictly, but there is a body of Jewish law that is the same body of Jewish law that you're going to find anywhere in the world. It comes from our sacred texts and people follow that with their idea of God. So there are some Jews who have a very traditional idea of God, that God does reward and punishes you based on whether you follow those rules. That is kind of a traditional conception. There are others who say like, I follow these rules because I believe that I'm connected to all human life and these rules are a good way for me to embody that that well that good treatment of other human beings. You know, you can you can have different conceptions of the divine. And I bet this is true, I'm guessing it's true in Christianity too. You probably have a lot of, you know, I, I once read a rabbi who said, you know, people have different relationships with me depending on how they see me. I am a brother, I'm a father, I am mm. a board member, I'm a teacher, I'm a I'm a customer. Right. He's mm. like, well then couldn't that be true for God as well? That people mm. see God in different ways depending on how they relate to God. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but I do like I like that. I'm gonna actually, I'll probably wrestle with that as I continue ironing the clothes that I talked about earlier. Because <laughs> um, I definitely didn't finish it. It's too many sets of clothing. Uh, no, I think, yeah, so Christians do do that. I often get called uh, heretical because I'm not willing to uh, make my Bible God, if that makes sense. Uh, there's, I'm not a big fan of that idol. Like the God that I worship can't, I, I stole this from a friend of mine. He's like, you realize like man made all this. Like it's all we made up. Like what are you talking about? How can you possibly think that that is God? Um, this just, it's, it's not possible. Yeah, but you'll have, and it sounds very similar, to, or, or at least I think similar, you have both sides, you know, people that are extremely literal on, no, it says this. And then I'm like, yeah, but that's somebody's interpretation of somebody's interpretation of somebody's interpret. I think it's Brueggemann that says, you know, we all read scripture, any scripture by the by the way, any scripture, not just Abrahamic based religious scriptures yeah. with whatever our inherent biases are. Um, of course, of course. No, yeah. that's absolutely right. I think, you know, one thing that I think is interesting about Judaism is like the core metaphor of Judaism is a really interesting one where it's like, you have these Israelites who have been freed from Israel, uh, I'm sorry, freed from Egypt. These Israelites have been freed from Egypt and this God of the Bible assembles them at Mount Sinai and basically offers them a covenant, says like, okay, here are the laws that I want you all to follow. Do you accept? And they accept it, right? It was like, it was an agreement. It was actually a partnership, which is a really interesting idea where it's like, yes, God is the senior partner. God is this all you know powerful being, but human beings have a lot of agency and responsibility in this partnership. They're not mm -hmm. supposed to be slaves or servants or robots. They're supposed to be partners with God in you know, creating a, a good and just world. So I think that, that core metaphor of Judaism is it's a really important one. Yeah. Um, I want to, so you, I don't even remember, I don't know what page it's on. I just know that I read it. Um, because <laughs> for those that can see the video, you'll understand why, um, but it doesn't matter. So you wrote in here, so there's two things I want to talk about. There's a bunch of things I want to talk about. So there are, I can't read my handwriting, three inalienable dignities, um, which I really liked those. I hadn't read those put that way, but I'm, I want to come to that secondly. And so I'm, I'm sure I'm going to say these names wrong. So you talked about, and I think it's in chapter two, rabbis, and debate something called a Mishnah and then mm -hmm. Judah Gemara yeah and then like Mishnah all the way to a Gemara yeah so can you walk me through none of that I didn't know any of that I'm showing my ignorance here but no I it's okay it I didn't either five years ago I, I found it fascinating and then I flipped as hard as I, I basically in the pdf again all it back to the bibliographies because I needed to find more it's just can you break that apart just a bit because I found it fascinating yeah, so we have, you know, the Bible, right? the, the, for us, we call it the, the first five books of the Bible mm -hmm. are the, you know, the Torah, that's our key holy text. It's about 2,500 years old. And, you know, that original document, it, it's, it's ancient, right? And it has a lot about animal sacrifices at a large temple in Jerusalem. Well, the temple was destroyed for the second time by the Romans in the year 70. Suddenly, this, this Bible, like, you can't live by this anymore in terms of you can't make sacrifices anymore, right? The temple's gone. So suddenly, it's like, well, what do we do? Like, how do we worship 
God. We used to do that through animal sacrifices, like many ancient peoples did. And so this group of ancient rabbis back in the year 70, they started reinterpreting the Bible for an era without a temple. So they said, okay, listen, God doesn't want sacrifices of animals. God wants sacrifices of prayers from our mouths, right? They kind of, so they reimagined the holidays to be celebrated without a temple. And that original kind of reinterpretation and commentary was the Mishnah. Now, later rabbis in the year, you know, in like centuries after that, they did a commentary on the Mishnah called the Gemara. So actually the way this is, and all together, this is called the Talmud. So you have the Mishnah, which is this commentary on the Bible. And then if you, you actually, the way it's laid out on a page is you have that in the center, and then you have the Gemara around it, which is commentary on the Mishnah. And then around that, you have commentary from later rabbis who are commenting on the earlier ones and so on and so on. So you know, Judaism is this kind of constant you know, effort to re continue to reinterpret our very ancient texts to ensure that they are still appropriate in our time. You know, this is why today in 90% of American Judaism, women can be rabbis. You know, gay people can be rabbis, gay people can get married in all except for Orthodox Judaism, which is again, 90% of American Jews. And the reason for that is that we've continued to understand our ancient texts in light of our, the progress we've made, just like what we've done with our constitution. <laughs> the original constitution literally said that certain people could be property. I, I mean, like that is the embodiment of evil to call people property. I mean, that is mm. just, it's profound. That's the most profound desolation of evil. And it took us a really long time to actually, you know, make the moral progress to the point where we actually could, as a society, say, yeah, actually, this is evil. I mean, it's horrifying how long it took, but we did, and we re-amended it. And I think we see a similar process in an interpretive religion like Judaism. And I'm sure other traditions have something similar, but I, the one I know about is Judaism. Yeah. How versed are you in other traditions? Because you said you stepped away from Judaism for a while. And I know a lot of people, when they step away from the faith, they either step into no faith or they step in and start dabbling into others. Like, where is that at for you? So I really didn't engage in any faith at all during those, that time away. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, yeah, just was busy with school and work and life. You know, I did a few Buddhist meditation classes, which was lovely. I learned a little bit about Buddhism, which I found fascinating, but I'm not you know, I just read a book called God is Not One, which it gives an overview of different faiths, making the argument that they're actually quite different from each other. I found it so helpful in just giving a little bit of an overview of different faiths. And I, I really want to learn more because I think each of the world's religious tradition offers important moralism for us. I, I once heard, I can't remember who said it, but <clears throat> I think it was a rabbi who said that there is a religious ecosystem in the world. And each one of the religious traditions kind of offer something important to that ecosystem. And when one is suppressed or dies out, we lose something, right? Our world becomes less balanced. So I think, you know, I really wish I, I, I would really like to learn more about the different tra traditions. So two of my favorite people, one of them is a good friend. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm friends with a, uh, uh, I don't know. So Alexander Shia, who's just brilliant. I actually think he would like his book as well. Um, so he was trained under Joseph Campbell a bit at Notre Dame in anthropology, also in psychology, went to seminary, is a Marianite Catholic, but he's steeped in really, really, really early, early, early church, like pre, he's really just steeped in that. And so like when he does Easter, he tries to do it in a better way, not in the carnivalistic, commercialistic, imperialistic version that we do now. Um, I think you'd enjoy his book, but he, as well as Barbara Brown Taylor, who is two of my favorite writers, both, I remember Alexander saying one time, he's like, no, I can learn something from Brahmins and from shamans and from Buddhists. And then I can come home and figure out how to find better glory in God and that like bigger, I don't mean glory in the way that people sing about glory. I mean, glory is the real word. And then Barbara Brown Taylor said something uh, when I chatted with her a while ago about, no, I can, I can find truth and meaning in other faiths. Like I don't have a stranglehold on that. It's just when I come home, it's Jesus that I come home to. But tomorrow when I go back out, I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. I'm learning I, something today. That I feel so passionately the same way. Right? Yes, my home is Judaism, but I love reading Nadia Bowles Weber. I love mm -hmm. her writing. I love Father Gregory, is it Father Gregory Boyle Doyle, the wonderful um, the priest. Glennon Doyle. It, who is the one who, I think it's Gregory, who works with... Um, formerly gang affiliated young people out in LA, I think. Oh, he that is Gregory Boyle. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, his books are mm -hmm. stunning and they're books 
I know they're books about the young people he's working with, but I, I also, I view them as books about the divine, right? Like he, mm-hmm. you know, they're very much spiritual books. So I just, I, I'm so moved by other people's experiences. You're right. Like I, I do, I do come home to Judaism. It's, it's the language I speak. It's the, the sensibility I bring to the world and that it is different from other traditions. They're all different, but I do think they're getting at similar things. Yeah. I want to be real honest. So as I was reading the book, I kept highlighting just different things that rabbis had said that I found brilliant. And then at the, about two thirds of the way through, um, I realized, why am I highlighting all these? I, I think I had improper expectations because of my ignorance of Judaism. I don't know what I was expecting because I haven't read really any Judy, Judy, Ju- whatever the word is. I haven't read <laughs> those te- outside of, you know, the Torah and whatnot. And I have like my favorite version of, I'll call it the Old Testament because that's my yeah. language is the one that Robert Alter did, because it is so much commentary. It literally is sitting 17 inches from your head. Um, I love it. I, I mine is literally 17 inches from my yeah. head here at my desk. It's great. I, yeah, I, um, I can't read any other version of the Old Testament but that one, just because I'm like, yes, this is... Now, I can understand how some people will be like, no, this is... Why is all this here? Why is Exodus 900 pages long? Because it needs to be. Um, so is that version of the Hebrew Bible similar to what you're talking about with Talmud, where like you're looking at it and there's just reams of paper after verse one is 17 pages? It's it, like very, it's a similar idea. You know, the Talmud isn't so directly a commentary on the Torah. Like it's not like line by line. Mm-hmm. It's not kind of arranged in the order that the Torah is arranged in it. It's actually arranged more by kind of topics of law, basically, like there's okay. a part on blessings of one on Shabbat, one on Pat, you know, they're on, so it's not arranged, but a lot of it is sort of understanding the fundamental laws of the Torah, of the Torah, kind of, you know, it's like, because the thing is, you know, the Torah says things like, love the stranger. Okay, well, what, what does that mean? Right, like, what, or it says, you know, it talks about, um, you know, giving money to those who are in need. Well, okay, how much? And then how do you do it? And how do you do it in a way that, that protects their dignity, that doesn't humiliate them, that, empowers them that doesn't make them feel embarrassed right there's a lot of details that are not quite specified in the bible you know it's a lot of kind of general ideas and then jews said okay wait a second how do we live these things right how do we actually embody these things you know the torah says on shabbat basically don't work have a day of rest okay well what, what does that mean it can i can i like what, what does it mean just to rest like can i just watch netflix can i hmm. go you know can i go to a rock concert like what, what does that mean to t- actually live these values, you kind of have to define them. Can you watch Netflix? Um, so it, again, <laughs> Judaism is not the world's you. most dogmatic religion. So if you are, <laughs> if you're a very, if you're an observant Jew, no, you can't. Right? You wouldn't. You wouldn't do that. The other Jews who are less, who are less traditionally observant, they will. Right? It's sort of every. You know, it depends on how you mm. practice. Judaism is very diverse, just like Christianity. Right? Yes. Saying Christianity, that doesn't. That that's almost doesn't make. You know, that term, it's so broad and it encompasses such a diversity of practices and beliefs and mm-hmm. Judaism is similar. Yeah, I work with a guy who is um, who's Muslim. And so the other day we weren't busy because we're not allowing people to come to the bank because of the coronavirus and, and wisely. And so we mm-hmm. had time. We can only help people on the phone, but because of other bigger banks that I won't get sued for libel about doing things without customers express written consent. Um, <laughs> I know that you know who I'm talking about. And I know that anyone- Thank that- you is listening and knows what I'm talking about. However, I won't say their name. Um, <laughs> we can't do anything over the phone either. So I'm really just answering the same question over and over and over again. But we started talking about religion and he asked me, he's like, well, all of you believe this, right? And I was like, so no. And I, I broke it down. He's like, so it's like 20 different things. I was like, oh, I'm just in the Southern Baptist at the minute. Like there are hundreds of different things. <laughs> and I was like, well, the Methodists don't believe any of that. And he's like, I don't understand. I was like, I don't either, honestly. Don't, I don't. Yeah. Right? It's so yeah. diverse. I mean, even Orthodox Jews are super diverse. Right? Mm-hmm. You have very modern progressive Orthodox Jews who go to Yale and become doctor, you know, they're who just aren't really, you know, whose lives are very similar to yours and mine. And then you have very, very traditional Orthodox Jews who live in really insular communities, like super diverse, right? Mm-hmm. Super yeah. diverse. Yeah. What are the three inalienable, inalienable, it's a hard word to say, dignities? <laughs> Um, and then you talk about it so early on in the book, I, I spent, actually, so when I read that, I actually set it aside for some time, thought about that for almost the whole day, didn't listen to podcasts that day. Um, oh. So what, kind of break those apart for me, what are those three mm-hmm. things? So 
this is a really interesting idea. This basically, the core idea here is that what I think is the core animating idea of Judaism, and this is something that others think as well, is the idea that we're all created in the image of God. And this is actually a verse from the Torah where it says that, that God created all of us in God's image. And, you know, whether you believe in God, don't believe in God, you're, it doesn't matter. What this means, and this is actually, as a rabbi named Yitz Greenberg put it, this is his term. He says that this means that we all have three inalienable dignities. And Rabbi Greenberg says, we are all infinitely worthy. We are all totally equal to every other person on this planet. And we are each completely unique. There is no one else like us. And you know, you can say, well, yes, yeah, Sarah, I think we all believe that. That's obvious. Not a single person believes that. Not a single one of us truly deeply in our heart believes that. Because if we did, why would we ever walk by a homeless man on the street who asks for help and, and we say, oh, sir, I'm sorry, not today, and we keep walking. If that man had been a celebrity, if that man had been someone famous or rich or powerful, you probably would have stopped and been like, oh my gosh, this is a celebrity. Like, wow, I need to, I'm gonna talk to this person. I mean, if there had just been a laptop lying on the street, you probably would have stopped and been like, oh, a laptop, whose laptop? But we walk by that man with a sort of polite nod because we actually, we don't think people in our society are all infinitely worthy and equal and unique. We actually think some people are more worthy, unique, and equal than other people based on their status, their power, their wealth, their beauty, their fame, their whatever it is. And so that idea, I think that that's really, that is just the core animating idea of Judaism. It's, it's it, I think all of Judaism is an expression of that idea. Yeah. Can you talk to me a bit about how prayer has changed or shifted for you? Uh, and, and you talk about it a bit in the book as well of what that looks like for you now? Like maybe kind of what was the prayer of your childhood that you walked away from and then what is it now? Hmm. So, you know, I think the prayer of my childhood was sort of unknowing prayer. Right? I'm like, you know, you're reading these ancient prayers, you're just kind of saying them, but I didn't really know what I was saying. And it just all, you know, I was bored. I couldn't really focus. Even I think as a young adult, a lot of the prayer just seemed like this very repetitive praising of this all-powerful God. And I was like, ugh, you know, I don't, it's not really comfortable for me. But, you know, now that I've started learning about Judaism and really studying the liturgy, it's quite, it's quite layered and complex. You know, Jewish liturgy, like, there is a core Jewish prayer called the Amidah, which is like a, it's a, just a major prayer that you say, you know, at most, many Jewish services. And the first blessing of that prayer, it ends with the phrase, shield of Abraham. It refers to God as shield of Abraham sort of an interesting phrase. It's like, where did that come from? It actually comes from the Torah. And it comes in a moment where God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm giving you the promised land. And Abraham does not respond by being like, whoa, God, you're here. You're giving me this land. Abraham says, well, you know, how am I to know that I'm, I'm to possess this land? Now, that's very interesting, right? When God shows up, right? It's like when God shows up and gives you something, you usually think you'd be like, thank you. Wow. But he's he's having a moment of doubt. He's not sure. Mm -hmm. And to kind of see this allusion to a moment of doubt, of unsureness, of, of maybe fear and the comfort and the present, it's like, that's really edgy. And I think there's a lot of complexity and allusions to biblical passages in the Jewish liturgy that if you haven't really kind of studied it, you wouldn't necessarily know. So I, I think I know a little more and I see the complexity of the prayers. I also think that I now understand that Jewish prayer isn't just scripted communal prayer in a synagogue. You know, that's sort of those are the times that most Jews gather is when they're going to the synagogue for the main holidays or maybe for a Shabbat service. But there's a very rich Jewish tradition of, of personal prayer. I mean, if you look at the Torah, right? My ancestors, when they wanted to talk to God, they didn't take out a book. They just mm -hmm. talked to God. And I, there's a wonderful practice called heat bode dut, complicated word, but it, it means self-seclusion. It was invented by an 18th century rabbi and basically what you do is you go out somewhere in nature, the woods, a field, somewhere where no one can hear you. It's good to do it at night if you can. And you just speak out loud to God. And you do it without pausing. If you run out of things to say, you say, run out mm. of things to say, talking, nothing to say. Has to be out loud. Can't be in your head. You have to do it for about 30 to 45 minutes. And if you don't believe in any kind of God, that's fine. You just say, well, I don't believe in you. I don't believe in you. I'm talking to open air. But you just keep talking. And you know, it's a very powerful practice. Um, you can do it inside too. If you have a, you know, just a room in your house where no one can hear you. It's um, that kind of pouring out of one's heart. You will be amazed at what you say. So I, that is a Jewish approach to prayer as well. Mm. One that I find particularly moving. Huh. I, I find that terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I, find, 
I mean, not that I don't think I could do it. Um, actually, yeah, I, I don't think I could do it. Maybe I could talk for four or five minutes, maybe. And uh -huh. then I would probably, I think I'd be afraid of what I'd say. I don't That's know what that sort says of the idea. What that says about me. <laughs> but uh, probably normal in that in that aspect. it's normal right a lot of people feel the first time i did it I, I was on a jewish silent jewish meditation retreat my first one which i already thought was super weird and they said we were going to do this exercise and i was like no way i am mm. not like that is so crazy no also so it's supposed to be silent yeah oh no 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 <laughs> the hippo dude is supposed to be out loud that was we were that was a break from the silence but um i found it to be really emotional and very powerful Hmm. So let's say hypothetically somebody's going to transcribe this episode in a minute. How do I spell that word that you just said? <laughs> so it's H I T B O D is in David E D is in David U T is in Tom. It's not what I wrote down. Is that all one word? Yeah. Oh, that, that's ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> I know. It's also it's at the beginning chapter three of my book. I think I it's at the beginning of chapter three. I think I wrote it out somewhere, so it's there too. The hardest one I ever did, and I will edit this out, is um I spoke with Mark Charles. I don't know if you know him or not. I um, I think he's a voice you would enjoy. So he's a Native American, um, Christian, that talks a lot about colonization and that type of stuff, and he lives in D.C. Um, he's currently actually running for president. At least I think he still is because he's effectively saying we can't actually, America was never great, nor can you say, he actually picks a bit on, I think, President Obama, when he's like, you know, it's not that, he's like, we were never great, we never had, you can't have reconciliation because we never had conciliation. And so we can't be a real nation until all the people have an actual voice. Um, and he's speaking from, as a Native American, um, yeah. but his voice is really powerful. But he wrote a book and in it, and so when I spoke with him, he, um, he said all these words in Navajo, that were so hard to get, but they're actually transcribed. <laughs> they're correct. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out how to find the right people to get their stuff. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, thank you. For doing My that. pleasure. I'm very, I'm a perfectionist, so I totally get it. <laughs> well, I realized I either had to say un into un unknown language or I couldn't halfway do it because it's literally somebody's language. Like it matters. Those, yeah, words, totally. those, words, those words matter and I can't, I either have to do it not at all or get it right. There is no, I could misspell an English word and I'd be fine with it. Right. I misspell some a different one. No. Um, so yeah. What for you? So you hear people talk about, you know, Judaism is my heritage, or Judaism is my culture, or Judaism is my faith. So for someone like myself, I'm like, well, how does that all work? Because you, I don't get that with Christianity, at, at least not usually. Maybe in a millennia we will, but not right now. Right. So Christianity is a religion. You know, mm -hmm. I think if you, you know, if, if someone's a Christian and then they decide, I don't believe in God, I think there is no God, I don't believe in Jesus, I don't believe there is God, Jesus mm -hmm. was God's son, it's hard to argue that they're still a Christian. You know, you know, they might have Christian values or you know, Christian community, but it's sort of, you know, once you've kind of let go of those core tenets of faith, it's, t you know, like that, you know, Christianity it is, it's a religion, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it's a bunch of, it's religious beliefs. So Judaism is more like a peoplehood. Like I am, you know, you become Jewish either by being born into a Jewish family or by converting to Judaism. So I tomorrow could say, that's it. I don't believe in anything in Jewish religion. I reject every single Jewish law. I reject every aspect of Jewish religion. I'm still Jewish because I was born to Jewish parents, right? I'm part of that peoplehood. That is, you know, I'm part of the Jewish people. So it's Judaism, it's a peoplehood that has a religion which is, it's a little bit confusing. I think a lot of people don't know this. So Judaism, it's not just a religion. Because you, know, you sometimes meet Jews who are totally not religious. They're atheists. They don't have any connection to Jewish religion, but their parents are Jewish. They were born Jewish. So they are still Jewish. They're part of the peoplehood. So it's like if I was, well, I was born in Texas. So if, it's, if it was, if for instance, my religion was also called Texan, but I was also born Texan, I'm still Texan, but I'm also not Texan. Yeah, kind right. of like that. Sure. Yeah. I, I overgeneralized <laughs> it. We did it. You made it work for me. So this I have two final questions. One of which is so um Judaism, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't ultimately concerned with what happens when I die. Or am I incorrect in that? And maybe that's not overall true. Um can, so can you walk me through it? Because that's the inverse of what people are gonna talk about on Sunday or what they talked about today. Well, provided <laughs> right. we could go to church. That you know what I mean. Um so Judaism is very much focused on repairing this world, on being good in this world, on, you know, being a partner with God to 
do good and help others and, and just repair the brokenness of this world. Mm -hmm. And we do these things not to earn a position in heaven or to avoid a hell. Like they're just, that's not the motivation. That's not really forefront. There are Jewish conceptions of an afterlife. There isn't really a permanent hell in Judaism. That's just not really something you find. I mean, it, there, there's, there's these sort of vague notions of an afterlife. And I think as you go into more observant branches, you'll see people who maybe think a little more about that, but that's just not in any way the focus of Judaism. Like it's a here on earth religion. You know, we, we do these things, you know, we follow these rules and we, we try to act the way we do because we, we think that this is what it means to be a good person, to, you know, serve the divine, to work with the divine, to heal the brokenness in our world. So there just isn't really that motivation about an afterlife. That's just not really something you hear Jews talking about. Yeah. Um, well, so to be clear, um, what you just described a bit about what you think, so I'll call it the kingdom of God. So people oftentimes tell me if I think hell is real, I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure hell is a metaphor. And I'm pretty sure every time I act in a way that I break shalom or peace, like that, right. that is what hell is. Like I'm physically actively participating in hell. And the inverse is also the kingdom of God is coming every time I physically act to repair things. So I also, I almost think that both are a metaphor, but I'm fine with that. I'm still working through oh. that. But um, I'm I love well that idea that I'm of a metaphor. Okay. I'm well aware that I'm the minority in my, in my <laughs> group for that. Um, I, don't, I don't care that I am though. So, um, <laughs> so the question I've been asking everyone. So when you, Sarah, say, hey, this is what God is. Like when I say the word, this is what the divine is. Like, what are you actually trying to say? Like try to give words to something that I'm aware of how impossible that is. Yeah. Um, but it's okay. Yeah. I like to watch people so, Yeah, no, it's great. I think whenever I talk, I think whenever I, I think unless you're a fundamentalist or an atheist, when you try to talk about God, it's going to be incoherent because you're talking about something that's so beyond our tiny little silly little minds. But when I talk about God, I'm talking about the animating source of all life. Um, I'm talking about this force of just boundless love and growth and actualization. Um, I'm talking about, you know, what happens between two people in, in deep human relationship. I think everything and everyone is part of this, this boundless loving energy. That's what I think God is. How do I relate to God? I, I relate to God as a you because I can't form a relationship with a force or with an energy. I just, I can't, that's not, that's not going to work for me. So I, I relate to the divine as a you and in very fleeting moments when I feel like I have touched into or felt the divine, it feels like just this boundless force of love that has been there all along and will always be there. And I, I am very moved by it and very overwhelmed by it. Um, and I think that God is, is not, not just something that is, but it's something that we choose to do or not do, right? I think that we can, you know, with this boundless energy, we, we can use it for evil or we can use it for good. We can be open to it and, and, and try to serve it and, and try to ourselves be forces of love and growth and care and actualization, or we can be close to it and be forces of hatred and cruelty and bigotry. So, you know, does it make sense that I think, think God is a force or this boundless source of life? Do I think it's all that is, but that I relate to it as a you? Yeah, that is intellectually totally nonsense, but it's what's true for me. <laughs> I like the way you started that, unless you're an atheist <laughs> or I forget what else you said. Any conversation about God yeah. is going to be incoherent. I, that makes a lot. Yeah, I like that. Because you're absolutely right. You're like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, let's, let's give it a go. Yeah. Right. It's like we have to have that humility. You know, I, mm. I, I find it so disturbing when people have the arrogance to say what God is and what God wants and who God loves and who God doesn't love. It's like, wow, who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I am, I am, yeah, I, I wow, I don't even think. No, it's, it, we're talking about something that's so much bigger than, yeah. than us. It's just, yeah, I yeah. think that's idolatry to, to reduce it to those terms. I 100% agree. Plug the places, Sarah, and then I will plug your book. Actually, I'm going to do that before you plug the places. We, I mean, we really didn't touch on maybe, what, 10% of the book, if that. <laughs> um, there's a lot in the book, and I meant what I said earlier, so I, I literally highlighted the, the bulk of the printout of the book that I have. So <laughs> thanks for writing. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to. 
I'm gonna actually have to buy the actual copy so I can get it bound and at least <laughs> to read. But plug the places. Where do people go if they want to a buy the book? I'm sure it's aware yeah. it's available everywhere books are sold. But where else do they go to to read your op eds? All of that goodness. Yeah, so you can buy the book anywhere you buy books online. A lot of independent bookstores are now you can get it delivered online, or if you prefer. You know, Barnes Nobles, Amazon, IndieBound, Apple Books, so many places to buy online. There's also an audiobook, which I actually read myself and mm. the Kindle version. And then I have a um I have a very bad Twitter account. Um, I hate social media. I think it's uh, destroying our souls and corrupting our democracy, but I do have a Twitter account. It's at here all along. And I have a website which is sarahherwitz.net. And that actually has some discussion guides just because you know a lot of a lot of folks just want to talk about it with friends or sometimes um, religious leaders want to do a class about it. So I kind of created almost like a curriculum of just questions that you can use to discuss it, think about it. So those are all free and you can just download them if you want. So I told you at the beginning how out of my uh, comfort zone I would be talking about Judaism. I should have, I should have went there. I could have downloaded those because I already <laughs> had the questions. <laughs> but it wouldn't have sounded like me, but I could have You were great, I by the way. I should have cheated. So, thanks. You were totally great. Your questions were awesome. I know. I appreciate that. Great. I appreciate that. Um, well, I do. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. This was really a joy, and I, I really appreciate what you're doing on the show, having these meaningful conversations about important issues across lines of faith. I think it's just awesome. Well, thanks. I, I'm giving it a good go. We'll see how long it goes. So, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't see it stopping anytime soon. So there we go. <laughs> Um, well, good. So I don't, I don't think I need, I'm not talking to that anymore. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, do thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Oh, and, as well pleasure. as your book. Really enjoyed it. Um, quite a bit. So, so. Me too. Yeah. I yeah. really. Are nice. you writing another one? Cause you said you don't like to write in your own voice, which is. Well, no. You know what? I was actually going to tell you, I'm like, can we not put that part about the op-ed in? Cause I, I feel like I don't want the forward to think that I, I did my best with the op-ed. I just, don't think it turned out quite as well. I'm not better. entirely certain I was recording at that moment. Okay, but. good. Because I was like, don't put that in. That was that sounded very disrespectful. I actually I love I actually love writing book length stuff because you have time, right? I'm not trying to like meet some deadline or like, you know, get some news hook, right? Like to get an op-ed published, you have to be mm -hmm. hooked into something in the news cycle. And it's like or like something that's timely, like Passover. So um I'd love to write another book and I'd actually love to write a book sort of just talking about the divine and God and kind of some of the Jewish thinking around, around God. Um, and I think it's, I love, like, whenever I talk to progressive Christians, I feel like there's a very, like, yeah, it's different language. There's some different theology, but there is this, I don't know, this similar sensibility, right? Like a, just this kind of openness and this very like loving, like non-judgmental, very humble, like mm. kind of theologically humble where it's like, you know what? I don't know. I just, I like non, non dogmatic. Like I, I sort of feel like a real kinship. I'm like, Oh, these are my, you know, it's like reading Nadia Bowles Weber <laughs> or like, you yeah. know, or father Doyle. I'm like, Oh man, these are, yeah. 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 Well, I don't know if I qualify as progressive Christian. I know I'm not fundamental, fundamentalist right. conservative. Um, but yeah, I mean, just if you look at like, you can't see the books behind me, but I have, I don't I think I have every faith up here. Yeah. So cool. Because I'm realizing, so like, like, so what I'll do is I'll read a book and then I'll go to the Biblia, like literally you, so oddly enough, I didn't ask you about this because you didn't write your book about this, but I really wanted to. Um, you yeah. have a little thing, an aside in the introduction or maybe in chapter one about, some people say this about Sodom and Gomorrah. And then you have like a little, not a one or a two, like a little asterisk that says it wasn't about that. It's not exactly what it says, but it's something like that. <laughs> that's what I was saying, yeah. And I would, but I, I really wanted to go to the, I'm like, well, she didn't list any, but that's what I'll do. I'll go to, I'll go to find the resources and then um, I'll buy another book and buy another book and annoy my it's wife because I bought another book. <laughs> it was actually that idea. I think, I gosh, I hope, you know, I didn't cite it because it's sort of a commonly, it's a common, sort of a commonly known thing in Judaism that's not about homosexuality, but that actually, one of the places I found that was a lecture that Christine Hayes, do you know her? Know she teaches, name. oh, she teaches an amazing Old Testament class online at Yale, totally online and free. She teaches a class about the Old Testament. It is so good. Hmm. Oh, I learned so much. It, it gives you all the historical context, how it's meant to be understood. Like it was, it blew my mind and totally changed my life. And she goes through the whole thing, Torah, prophets, all of the stuff. It's so good. Yeah. Well, my dad and I spent, so I literally wrote him, I think it's 4,000 word reply because I, he said, let me make sure I'm not recording anymore. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, no, I, what the video was, yeah. 